Sunday morning, you know? Remember when the praise team used to sing like, get up from here, sitting down, get up from here, sitting down, get up from here, sitting down, the Lord can't use you, sitting down, get up from here, sitting down, get up from here, sitting down, get up from here, sitting down, the Lord can't use you, sitting down, bring But nothing's turned around I'm here to let you know That God can wipe your tears God is standing by Even though you may not understand All the reasons why Everything's gonna work out to his plan
All right, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, reading from the 15th verse and following. Know you not that your body are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Is that term joined, connected, tied. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We continue again tonight on the subject of soul ties. Yes. <clears throat> and... I'm giving tonight some signs and symptoms how you can know when you are involved in a soul tie. And I'm focusing, emphasizing on the negative soul tie because there is a positive soul tie. And then somewhere down the road, as I continue in the message, I will give you a definition of what a soul tie is. You have a general idea from the last message that I did, I'm going to be coming down and breaking it down like a fraction. How can you tell that there's a negative soul tie at work in somebody's life or in your own that somebody could be you? There are some side effects that soul ties have, and these side effects are evident. These side effects are visible. These side effects are noticeable. Number one. There is a loss of self-confidence and individuality. A loss of self-confidence. You have lost your mojo. That's what the world says. You have lost your mojo. You have lost the essence of you. You no longer have your swagger. You're iffy about doing things. You're always questioning yourself. And even when you do something right to you, it never looks good. You're always criticizing yourself. You're always self-depreciating, always talking down about yourself. You never have anything good to say about yourself. And when people tell you something good about you, oh, that's you just flattering me. Because you're not accustomed to being told the truth for once in your miserable life. 
You're cussing the people cussing at you and insulting you. That's your atmosphere. But there's a loss of self-confidence. And secondly, individuality. What does that mean? You have lost yourself because of this connection that you have with this individual. You have lost who you are because of the connection you have with that group. They have immersed you so much into them, into their mindset, into their mind frame, into their mentality, into their way of thinking and acting. You don't even bother to ask yourself if you want to participate in what's happening. You just go ahead and do it because the group is doing, doing it. You have a herd mentality. You're no longer your own person. You do what the group does. You follow the leader, leader, leader. You follow the leader. And you have lost your self-confidence. You have none or very little. And you have lost your individuality. In this world of wanting one world government and stuff like that, people have learned to not think for themselves. They have learned to do what is right for the general public, they say. It's their way of taking away your individuality. So number one side effect is you lose your self-confidence and you lose your person. You lose you. You lose you. You have you, but you have lost you, the real you. You never do what you want to do. You never say what you want to say. You have to feel out the group first. And if they're flowing to the left, you flow to the left. If they're flowing to the right, you flow to the right. Self-confidence is gone. Individuality is gone. Number two, you have a sense of inferiority and uh, incompetence. You feel inferior to everybody. And if they ask for your opinion, you don't have one. You say, man, whatever you all decide, I will go with it. You never speak up for yourself. Because you don't think you have a voice and an opinion. And you don't think that your voice is of such that it needs to be heard or your opinion is a valid one. You always let him do all the decision. You always let her do all the decision making. And you just tag along because you're the tail that's dragged behind in view of the fact that the head is the decision making member of the body. You know you're a tail when all the decisions are made without your input. You're a tail. You can strut all you want to. You're a tail. Nobody asks your opinion. And even when you give it, they just look at you and cut their eyes. And you know to shut up because they don't want your opinion. And you, you learn by their eyes alone. They have learned to talk to you through a look. And they have you so trained that you can never give your voice. They, you cannot voice your opinion. You have a sense of inferiority and incompetence. You, you think everybody is smarter than you. Everybody is brighter than you. Everybody is more talented than you. Everybody has got it going on. And the thing is, you don't pay attention to these people that you look up to. You are further ahead in life than all of these people. You're driving, aren't you? Are they driving? They're still walking. They're still catching a cab on Uber. You have your own ride. You're driving to where you want to go. They're still renting, living in mommy's house. You got your own property. You don't see all of that. All you see is, is the areas that they have allowed you to think that they are superior to you. No, you need to stop and let somebody tell you who you are because obviously you have no clue. You have no clue at all about your worth, about your value, about who God has made you. You have to ask people's opinion about your dress. How do I look? I don't care how you think I look. When I look at a mirror, the mirror said, you look fine. I say, you better tell me the truth. And I know you just told me the truth. I do look fine. I make this clothes look nice. Clothes don't make me look nice. You say things like that, oh, you're just full of yourself. You're just full of shame and low self-esteem. And you haven't met people like me because you're not accustomed to people being bold and bodacious. You call it arrogance because somebody is full of confidence. I know who I am. I'm to die for and Jesus went to the cross for me. I had to be valuable. God evaluated me and thought this guy here, he is worth the life of a God and sent his only begotten son who went to the cross and paid full price for me. I am to die for. Oh, that's my first rocker shocker. There you go. There you go. Yes. Loss of... Uh, <clears throat> you have a sense of inferiority. And incompetence. You have no voice and no opinion in whatever decision is going to be made. Buenas noches. Como esta? Number three. Loss of clear thinking in decision making. Loss of clear thinking. You used to be a clear thinker. You used to have an opinion. Now you don't. Now you're double checking. 
Now you're full of self-doubt and self-loathing. Now you're always questioning two, three hundred times. Why, uh, you know, I don't think my idea will be a good one, man. You all go ahead with what you think. I'll just tag along. And you'll become nothing but a tag along. Loss of clear thinking in decision making. You don't think clearly. Your, your brain is fogged up. It's like there's smoke in your brain. You can't clearly articulate what it is that you want to say. And I have to stress this part because most people are like this. They double check because they're full of self-doubt. They double check everything they say. They double check everything they do. They double check. They go and change and change again and change. How do I look? You look good. Are you just saying that? Well, you look horrible. Oh, don't say that. Well, I told you you look good. You don't believe the truth. You look horrible. And after a while, with people like that, you have to decide not to bother to tell them how they look because they keep changing five, six, seven times and they can't make up their mind what it is they want to wear. Look, it's your clothes. You make the clothes look good. Don't ask anybody their opinion how you look. If you know you look good, you go out there and strut your proverbial stuff. You're the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. <laughs> Most people don't have that kind of bold. They say, oh my goodness, am I too fat? Am I too thin? Does this thing make me look fat? Does this thing make me look thin? I don't feel too nice, you know. I don't feel... Look, stop it. You're made in the image and likeness of God. Stop double doubting and cross-referencing and spitting on the image that God created. What you're saying to God is you did a horrible job when you made me. You made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. Number four, you're full of double-mindedness. You cannot make a decision and stick to it. You're always taking back stuff to the store that you bought because you want to exchange it with your raggedy self. No store wants to sell you because they know you're going to come back. I know some people like that. They're always taking things back to the store, taking things back to the store. Uh, this, it didn't quite fit the way I thought it would fit. And yeah, yeah, Ray Ray. No, stop it. You're full of double-mindedness. Elder James said that. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And such a person shall receive nothing from God. You have not been receiving anything from God. It has nothing to do with your living a sinful life. It has to do with your double-mindedness, with your inability to make a decision and stick to it. You're always backing and forthing, backing and forthing. When are you going to stop? Just make a decision, win, lose, or draw. And go on with your bad self. Yes. Number five. You're on pause to decide. You're on pause when it's time to decide. You can't decide. You're stuck. You're stuck in a rut. You're stuck in time. You're stuck in a limbo. You're stuck in the 70s. Got the one Afro. We knew you since 1970. With that Afro, you haven't changed it into anything else. Now we're tired of that Fro now. Fro has come and Fro has gone. Fro has come again and gone again. You're still in the Fro. You, you need to stop the froing and start toing and froing. <laughs> you're on pause to decide number six loss of peace loss of peace you're always agitated tense and nervous fearful and you're weary before you even go to work you haven't gone to the job yet but you're tired already because you're, you have lost your peace you're agitated you're tense and nervous you're fearful and weary before you do the job why do these things happen these are signs that you have a soul tie that's affecting you. There's somebody that's pulling the essence of you, the strength of you. Your mind, you have mind links. Your soul, you have soul links. Your will, you have will links. You can no longer do your own will because your will is linked to somebody else. The will, the mind, and emotion. Your mind linked to somebody. You think, what would this person think? What would this person do? What would this person wear? Listen, you are not this person. You are you, for God's sake. For once in your miserable life, before you die, let's see you. Show up. You're here, but it's not you. You're just trying to play somebody else. You'll become a cheap copy of some raggedy, unoriginal people. They're not even original that you're trying to copy. You're the original photocopy with your raggedy self. So, Rev, you can't call people raggedy self. That's why I don't watch you. Because, you, you know, you, you, you're too blunt and your word is acidic and caustic. Yeah, that's right. At least I know who I am. <laughs> Full of anxiety. Number seven, you're full of anxiety and you feel pressured by people's presence. You're full of anxiety and you feel pressured by people's presence. 
And if the people say, boo, you pee your skin. If the people say, boo, you wet your pants. If the people say, boo, you're pressured by people's presence. You cannot be yourself because somebody is there. You would have been laughing if that person was not there. You would have been serious if that person was not there. But once they come, you start grinning like a school child. You start laughing like a hyena because you're trying to please them by laughing or being silent or quiet or whatever it is that you feel that that person wants you to be in this mode and you get in that mode right off because that person is there. You feel pressured by people's presence. So what else is new? If somebody's around, you act up all deep and all cute and full of pizzazz and depending on who is around, you, you put on the act because you're an actor. The only thing with you, you don't get no Tony, you don't get no Grammy, you don't get no Oscar, but all your miserable life you've been acting. I said miserable life twice, I'm not going to say it again. Number eight, <clears throat> you know you're in a, in a negative soul tie when people have to guilt and threaten you to get things done. They guilt you to get things done or they threaten you to get things done. You know, we have been friends for a long time. You know, you can't do this for me. That's guilt right there. They're using pressure and guilt to make you do what they want to do because they can't get it out of you any other way. And so they guilt you. You know, I'm your mother, you know, when you were a baby, you were a very sickly baby, and I used to wake up nights and rock you to sleep, and now you can't do this to your mother. You know your mother loves you, and she's using love, and the fact that they look after you when you are a baby. And they make you feel guilty. <clears throat> Good night, Pastor Joyce. They guilt you into doing things. They threaten you to make you do things. And you do it because of guilt, you do it because of threats. You don't do it out of a clear heart, a pure mind, and a pure conscience. They guilt you into doing it. They look at you funny and make you do things by a look. Some of you are like dogs that are trained. Certain looks that certain people give you and you shut up for the rest of the day. You don't say a word. Why? Because that person has your number. They've got your number and they know what to do. They know the pressure points. They know how to manipulate you because they're manipulators. They're experts at manipulation. And they know what to do and say to get you to shut up. They know what to do and say to make you to do whatever it is that they want. They know what to, to do and say to make you cut down on the price of something that you know it's a thousand bucks. But this joker comes and wants it for 20 bucks and you give it to them because they make you feel guilty. Number nine. You know you're in a negative soul tie because you're always people-pleasing. You're not pleasing yourself in anything. You're people-pleasing. You're a people-pleaser. You're a monkey in a cage and they put bananas in front of you. And whatever they want you to do, you scratch yourself when they say scratch yourself. You're a people-pleaser. You're guilty and resentful of the control, but you still go ahead and do what it is they want you to do. Number 10. You can't say no. You cannot say no. When I first came to North America, these 1-800 people will call and they make you feel so good about yourself. And you have to have this product. If you don't have this product, you're, you're in 1950s. You've got to buy this product and yeah, 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 yeah. And they use this subtle pressure and, and they prime you up and pump you up and, and, and whisper nice sweet platitudes in your ear and make you feel like you're the power of God if you buy this product. And you end up buying products you don't like and sometimes you don't even use it. When we were moving out from the first place we had rented, I was shocked at how many things we had in the storage. We had to take them to the dump. Some of them were not even used. Brand new stuff with the tag on them that we had to have that we never use. You've got to learn to say no. You've got to learn to say no. You've got to learn to say let me think about it. You've got to learn to say not now. You got to learn to say, come back tomorrow if you're really interested. Let me think about it. I got to talk to my husband about this. Got to talk to my wife about this. I've got to see what my budget is like. You've got to learn to say no. Oh, yes. Don't let people make you be because you're a Christian that you have to say yes to everything they come up with. No, you don't have to say yes to everything. You've got to learn to say no. I met a woman uh, about five months ago. This COVID has been around a while now, about five months ago. And she ran up to me here in, uh, in Canada and she shook my hand. So I'm looking at her like, what did I do now? 
Because when people shake your hand and, you know, the next thing you know, that's when the lashes start coming on your back. They flatter you first before they clap some lashes on you. And she said, you Reverend S.C. Bumantio? I said, yes. I got a brother as a preacher. She said, no, 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 it's you. I want to thank you. And she started crying. I'm looking at her like, what did I do to this woman? From laughing and shaking hands to crying. She said, Rev, you taught me to say no. I was so relieved. <laughs> She said, everybody in my family and in my friends group, they could get a yes from me like that. She said, I live a stress-free life because of you. I said, no, it's not me. You did that. You did that all by your lonesome. She said, no, I know I did it by myself, but you were the ones. She said, that day I left the church. I was so angry with you. I was so upset. I said to my sister, this man is as mean as a junkyard dog. That's me saying that. How could he tell, want you to learn to say no? What kind of a man of God is that? The Bible said freely you have received and freely you give. And her sister, thank God for her told her, you better shut up and take some good advice. That's the best message you have heard in your life, my sister. With all due respect, you say yes too easy. Oh, my goodness. And she said, I learned to say no. And she said, now I look forward to saying no. <laughs> I said, can I ask you something? She looked at me, she said, no. <laughs> Just say it with me. No. You don't have to say it nasty. Just say it nice. Say no. That's the word for today, and I drink to that. Say no. All right? Now that we have mastered the power of no, let's say something else. Give me some time to think it over. And they ask you how long you need. I need, a, I need a week to think it over. Let me think on it. The third thing you learn to say is, not right now. I have uh, had some things planned and I can't do what you're uh, asking me to do right now. I may be able to do it later, but not now. Let me think about it. Or you just plain, so to avoid them coming back, you just hit them where it hurt and tell them it one time. Say, No. No, say no. No, 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 say no. You got to go. Say no, no, no. Give them the blow, blow, blow. You got to say, 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 say no. N to the O, N to the O. O, O, N to the O. O, O, N to the O. O, O, N to the O. You got to say no. Say no. No, no, everywhere you go, 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 N to the O. Oh, you got to say no. <laughs> Your soul tied to things and situations and people when all you can say is yes. All right, I'm going to go in the opposite direction now. You know you're involved in a negative soul tie, when you're feeling pressure to say yes, you're feeling pressure to say yes. Number 12, you lose your ability to love others, to really love others, because you are not there. You're so tied to somebody, and when you're so tied to somebody, you don't have all of your soul. That's why you can't love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind, because... Uh, Joan got a part of your soul, and Jenny got a part of your soul, and Jerry got a part of your soul, and somebody else got a part of your soul. So you're not you. You're not whole. When they talk to you, they're talking to three quarters of you, because the other quarter is all over the place, all these people that you've been sleeping with and sexing with. And you're soul tight and connected to all of these jokers all over the place. Some of them, you can't remember their names. It's a blur with you on your one-night stand living with your crazy, wild self. You feel pressure to say yes. You lose your ability to really love people because you watch the movie too often. They meet each other in a minute. They're in bed the next minute and you feel you have to live like that because if you're not living like that, you're not hip. You're not cool. You're not in with the swing. You're too archaic and old-fashioned. So you lose your ability and you don't like people. And even people that love you, you try to do things to hurt them because that's your zone. You got to dig the wound and throw salt and you're happy when you give them a good dig. You have a secret joy out of wounding people because you don't have the ability to love. You lost that a long time ago when a piece of your soul was cracked and gone with whoever it is. Number 13. 
The presence of some people causes you to have resentment and anger. You resent them and you're angry at them because they are your controllers. You know that you're so weak. Whatever they tell you to do, you will do. You're as weak as trash. You have no resistance. And you resent these people, but you have no willpower to stand up to them. Yes. Your resentment and you're angry with them because they are your controllers. They are your manipulators. They tell you to jump, you ask how high, and you jump, hurting your feet. Yes. Number 14. You know you're in a negative soul tie when you, there's a loss of personal freedom. There's no spiritual liberty. Let no one take your liberty. You have no personal freedom. Your time is tied up to other people's agenda, to other people's thing. They have to do something at four. You have to be along with that to do it at four. Your four o'clock now is taken up by other people. Loss of personal freedom. They tie you up on the phone for one hour. Who can tie you up on your phone for one hour? And, and some of you go through that. You made the call, and the other person who did not make the call is doing more talking on the phone than you and keeping the conversation going for, for two hours. No. No, I made this call. If you wanted to talk to me that much, you would have called me. But I called you. And if I call you, I you owe it to me if I call you to at least give me a two minute to get in something sideways. You can't dominate the conversation. Loss of personal freedom. Loss of spiritual liberty. You're so tied up to the pastor. I saw a woman in Bahamas there abusing on the public space. Some friend of hers who was taking the pastors close to the laundry every week. And, uh, and he's married. He got a wife and his wife wouldn't take his laundry. And this sister who's married would not take her husband's laundry. But is taking the pastor's laundry. Some of you women, you go too far with these pastors. You got to wash their laundry. You, no, let him wash his own laundry. He's got two hands and two feet. Let the Rev go wash his own laundry. Let him go do his own laundry. Let the laundry mat do it for him. Stop this nonsense. Oh, Rev, can I wash your underwear? Have you lost your mind? My mother couldn't wash my underwear. What? Yeah. From age five, six, seven, eight, Granny taught you how to do stuff like that. I go to some places and people, to, uh, uh, you can put your laundry in a basket. Somebody will come and pick it up and say, you, you, you have lost your mind. They look at me like, what do you mean, Rev? I said, nobody washes my laundry but me. He said, oh, okay, okay, all right, me sorry. But you know, other preachers, that's other preachers, that's not me. That's inordinate affection to have this excessive love. A preacher, you washing his laundry, you married to me and washing another preacher's laundry, ain't going to happen. I don't care if he raised the dead. You're not going to wash his laundry. Name of Jesus too. <laughs> Loss of personal freedom and spiritual liberty. The Rev is running your life. You can't even do anything without his permission. You got to ask for everything. Rev, uh, I have a Malta in my fridge. Can I drink it? No, and you don't drink it. <laughs> Some of you, you, you take your Christian life overly you take it overboard you have to ask the pastor if you can kiss your wife you have to ask the pastor if how many times a week you can make love to your wife you have to ask the pastor what color car to buy you have to ask the you, you all talk too much of your business to these pastors and they love to have it so asking you all these private questions the devil is a liar you have trained yourself you've been trained by that excessively controlling manipulating rev and you have lost your spiritual liberty and lost your personal freedom. You can't even go out on the weekend because Rev wants you to come to church and pray and fast. Not this weekend, Rev. My family is going out together to the falls. Oh, but this is our fasting and prayer week. You'll fast and pray without me. The kingdom of God can roll on with me at the falls and you here doing your fasting and prayer. They deliberately call fasting and prayer only when a new preacher is in tongue or some other church has a revival and the revival is kicking butt and they don't want you to go. So they call a fasting and prayer or a cleaning up of the church. What are they doing that? To take away your personal freedom. You can't choose to go. In fact, some of you, whether the thing is happening or not, you can't go to another church. Because Rev is letting you know it's a sin to go to another church. Let me free you. It is not a sin to go to another church. Look, even though you're faithful to your church, you're single with your single self. And some of you single people, you're single because you have no sense. You're single. 
Your church got children that are from 10 to 15. You know you're not going to marry a 15-year-old or a 10-year-old. And all the men in your church are boys 10 to 15. So what do you do? You keep going to that church 10 to 15? If you're going to meet Christian men, you got to meet them at concerts, conferences, or church somewhere of that effect. So you take a Sunday off from your church and you go to a church that got a lot of single men. You sit yourself down and dress your best and give God the glory and praise in that church that you've gone to. That pastor should have enough sense to be introducing you to single men, but they don't do that. They don't care about that. Once you sit your tail down there and bring your tithes and offering and fried chicken for the bishop and wash his dirty underwear, he's happy with that. But this is the time to take your liberty back in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And to that I say, rocker shocker. Get back your freedom. Some of you church has made you a slave. You're in bondage to them pastors. They control your tail. Take your tail away from their hand. And go on with your bad self. <laughs> oh yes. Loss of personal freedom and spiritual liberty. Mwah. Number 15. You have lost your good name. You have lost your good name. I'm not going to make any mention. That's self-explanatory. Number 16. You're feeling smothered in the relationship that you're in. Your space has been encroached upon by many people. You're feeling smothered in the relationship that you're in. People, you can't breathe by yourself. Somebody's there to, to help you breathe almost. They've taken over your life to the point where you feel smothered. You feel like you're lying on a bed and somebody has thrown a pillow across your nose and they're sitting on it and there are 300 pounds of Margaret Bonds and they wouldn't get off your face. You're sitting on that pillow, smothering you. Your space has been encroached upon. People have passed lines and marks that they are not supposed to pass. They have no sense of boundary, and you have no sense of boundary. Come on, y'all. You're being smothered. They're too near to you. They're too up in your Kool-Aid. There are too many mind links, too many will links, too many emotional attachments to people that you don't even know. But you're connected to them strong, 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 strong. Because of a soul tie. You can have a soul tie because of close association and regularity with the people that you meet all the time. You become like them. You act like them. You think like them. They encroach in your space. They don't tell you when they're coming. Just knock on the door and come right in. They don't know what your agenda is for the day. And they want to gaff. As if you got nothing else to do but sit your tail and gaff. The devil is a liar. You're smothered. Time to take your freedom back. Hmm. Number 16. You know you're in a negative soul tie when people ask you too many questions and they make too many suggestions about your life. They ask too many questions and they make too many suggestions. And they say things like, if I were you, well, right off the bat, you're not me. Get out of myspace.com. You're not me. You're not me. Don't ask me all them questions. Are you the Mossad, the CIA, the KGB, the FBI? Every time I see you, you got 20 questions to ask me. What's up with you? Why are you always up into information? Are you the popo? <laughs> too many questions and too many suggestions about how you should run your life. Look, let me warn you. Time spent with people causes soul ties. Time spent with them. The same way iron sharp met iron and man sharp met the countenance of his friend. Evil communication corrupt good morals, corrupt good manners. Time spent with a person causes soul ties. You start to miss them. You start to act like them. You start to say things they're saying. Number two, I'm telling you what causes soul ties. Time spent with people causes soul ties. Number two, words cause soul ties. Like what words are you talking about, Rev? I can't live without you. I'll never get over you. You're always on my mind. You're always on my mind. Maybe I never told you. Da, da, da. I'm so lucky that you're mine. The simple things we should have said and done. But I never took the time, oh baby, you're always on my mind. And they get all Willie Nelson on you. You're always on my mind. <laughs> oh, 
Words can cause soul ties. I'll never get over you. I can't live without you. I can't control my emotion. I need your love and devotion. Put your arms around me. Yeah. Arms around me. Oh, darling, I knew it was you. Oh, please tell me what to do. You gave me the will to go on as soon as I picked up the phone. Words cause soul ties. You hear it. A woman told me one time, she said, Rev, I can't stand that man. I said, what are you doing going out with him then? I've known you together for over a year. She said, it's two years, Rev. I said, you're going out with a man for two years, you can't stand him? What's the, what's the, what is it that he adds to the relationship? He said, she said, he doesn't add anything. But he tells me sweet lies. <laughs> she knows he's lying. She said, yes. I said, you know he's lying. She said, yes. I said, but Rev. When he tells it, he tells it to, so sweet, he make my knees buckle. Say, you try with that, your knees buckle. Words cause soul ties. Vows and commitments and promises cause soul ties. The Bible said you're snared by the words of your mouth. What does it snare mean? You're stuck like glue in something because you made a vow, you made a commitment, you made an oath, you made a promise. And you're connected to that person until that promise is delivered upon you have an attachment, a connection, a soul tie to that person. Vows and commitments and promises. I do promise to be whatever, whatever. Number four, sexual contact causes soul ties. And these ones are harder to break. You become one soul with that person. For some people, in touch on Facebook means in touch in bed. And that person becomes your kryptonite superman. You feel attached to him, her, connected to him, her, because of sexual activity that the two of you are involved in. You get up at night longing for them. You long for them. You, you grieve for them. You wish they were there. You, 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 whatever. Number five. A soul tie is an emotional bond that ties you to another person or persons and it ties you to their mind, it ties you to their will, it ties you to their emotions. They are tied to your mind, will, and emotions. It's an emotional bond that ties you to another person or group of persons. You can be soul tied to one person, you can be soul tied to many people at the same time. You can be soul tied to a group. You know the Bible says, give no place to the devil. Don't open the door for Satan to come in. Because if he comes in, he will take the whole property. A soul tie is a connection that unites you to someone else. A soul tie is a connection that binds you to someone else. A soul tie is a connection that keeps you thinking about that person, wanting to be a blessing to that person, wanting to be near to that person, wanting that person to be in your space.com, wanting to be in bed with that person. You can't live without them. You think of them every day and you wish this, that, that, and that could happen. You are tied. You are linked. It's a mind link. If they're not present there, it's a mind link. It's a will link. It's an emotional connection. You have to hear their voice for the day. You have to hear their voice for the week. You have to see them or else you, you can't live. You, you just are not fulfilled if their picture is not in your yai. Yes, I said it, yai. A soul tie is a connection that unites you with someone else. A soul tie can destroy your loyalty to God. You can't stay faithful to one person because your soul is connected to many partners. A lot of people have lost their connection with God in this COVID-19 political season because they are too connected to their party. They can't love Jesus. And they don't love Jesus as much as they love their politician. Don't tell me I'm lying. I know I'm telling the truth. Soul ties destroy loyalty. You can't stay faithful to your wife because you had a freak before you got married and your wife is not willing to do the freaky stuff and now you miss the freak while you're married to your pure wife and you, your loyalty is not in the bed with her when you're in the bed with her. It's somewhere else with Miss Freak. Number nine. Because of soul ties, your soul becomes a highway for demonic traffic 
and demonic activity. Listen to me carefully. Because of soul ties, your soul becomes a highway for demonic traffic and demonic activity. You pick up on the person that you're tied to. You pick up on their behavior. You duplicate their ways. You experiment with drugs that they experimented. They got you hooked on all kind of stuff that you weren't hooked on before. You're gambling. You're looking at pornography. You're drinking liquor. You're womanizing. You're manizing. You're behaving like them because of soul ties. And you become a highway to demonic traffic. Everything that was running through their life is now running through your life. You open the door and a super highway connects you to them. And anything that can get through them can get to you and now operates through you. Then you go home to your wife and you take all that mess home to her. And she is now in love with women because the, the gal that you slept with, she, she was switching sides, men, women, anything goes. And you brought home that anything goes spirit. And your wife's spirit could not handle the anything goes spirit. Now she's in love with women. You are the one that brought that home to the house. She wasn't like that until you got soul tied with all these people that you're jumping in and out of bed with. I'm talking to the church now. I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking to the church. During a soul tie, there's a spiritual residue. During a soul tie, there's an emotional residue that is deposited in your body, in your spirit, in your mind, in your emotions. That person, when you are soul tied to them, they connect you to themselves. And whatever they are, you are. Whatever you are, they are. Every spirit that they are susceptible to, you are now susceptible to. Every power that is running through them that is unlike the power of God and has nothing to do with the kingdom of God, but it's available in them, now it's available in you. If they are a witch, witchcraft power will begin to operate through you. If they are a lust bucket, you will be inundated with lust, the likes of which you've never had before. If they are a liar, you will begin to lie. Like my mother would say, you lie like a horse is trotting. You know how hard trot, they trot constantly, consistently, continually, continuously. That's how you are now. If they are a womanizer, you become a womanizer for no reason. You were not that before you met that person. And now, there you go. You're Don Juan with your bad self. During a soul tie, there's a spiritual residue, an emotional residue that is deposited in your body, your soul, your spirit, your will, your mind, your emotions. Number 11, soul ties are powerful and painful. You are bound to them. You become a soul mate with them. You need their love and affection. You crave their closeness and acceptance. That guy could treat you like a dog. He could slap you around and cheat on you and give you all kind of STDs. And if he calls you now, you will take a shower quick and run to his apartment, to his raggedy rat infested roach infested apartment and you will sleep with him because he had a booty call and if he had a booty call you had a booty call too because he called you soul ties are powerful they drag you out of that place you said i'll never go back no man will ever beat me again and the next day he put a whooping on you and you say well if you don't beat me you don't love me people don't understand the power of a soul tie you you talk sense into people today and tomorrow mr sweet back comes back with his sweet back, he winks at her, and she's gone again. She has no resistance for him. Her soul is yearning for him, calling to him. Because when he had her the first, second, or third time, he did things with her and to her that she, he took her to zones that she never would have gone. And he knew what he was doing. He was dogging her out. He was turning her into his slave. And when he crooks that finger she has to come because he has trained her he has broken her spirit he has penetrated her soul he has cracked her soul and has downloaded into her his mess so that when he feels messy the mess in him will call to the mess in her that he has downloaded and she cannot resist because soul ties are powerful oh i felt my preacher coming on yeah, that's why you can't love your wife. Because you sleep with too many women, with your crazy self. As if more women would make you more man. Soul ties are powerful and painful. You are bound to that person. That's why you give them the gold chain that belongs to your wife. And you have no experience to talk about somebody robbed me. Who are you lying to? 
You need their love and affection. You crave their closeness. You crave their acceptance. Oh, glory to God. Let me give you some tools now. Man, I got so much stuff here. I need to write a book on soul ties. Let me give you some tools as to how you can avoid getting into this trap. And we are going to have to have another sit down. But I feel like I've given you enough to get you thinking. And some of you, you can't take too much stuff either. You're not very studious. You don't like all this information. You want shouts and all kinds of fluffy kind of preaching. And if I get laryngitis and start a shout, you feel happy. I feel the anointing of the Lord coming down in my soul. I feel a shiver in my liver. The power of God is upon me right now. People say, ooh, Rev was on fire tonight. But I didn't fire. That's just fluff. That's just excitement. That's just hype. Now, I can do that. But when I hype, I hype with excitement. But I hype with word. I hype with rima. I hype with... <laughs> there he goes again boasting about himself. I'm just telling you the truth. Hmm. Look. Psalm 34 and 18 says, Deliver us. You know that deliver us from evil prayer? 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. My advice to you is number one, run. <laughs> Are you to the end? Run. Number two. Pray for deliverance from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Run. Pray for deliverance. Number two, Psalm 107, 1 John 1 9. Value yourself more than that person values you. Value yourself more than other people. Nobody will have any value for you if you don't have a high opinion of yourself. Number three, don't cover up and pretend like everything is hunky dory. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Don't cover up. Don't say, I don't have no soul tie. Rev is not, that's not for me. That's for them. The people that say that's for them, those are the rascals that are guilty as sin. Value yourself more than other people will value you. Don't cover up. Then you must renounce that thing. Put it out. Take a firm stand. Remove its right to exist and stay with you. Get rid of every reminder of that person that you're negatively soul tied to. Get rid of their perfume. Get rid of their jewelry. Get rid of their pictures. Get rid of their music. Get rid of their DVD. Get rid of, get rid of, get rid of, get rid of. Ah! Get rid of stuff. Get rid of everything that reminds you of them. And don't be half-hearted about it. Get rid of it. Throw it out. Yes, get rid of the sheets, the flat screen TV, the shoes, the watch, get rid of it all. Change your locks. Yeah, I know you give him a key. You must come in when you feel like, you know, just call and let me know. I leave the back door or the front door open or you can use this key. Change the lock. Don't worry to take back the key. He can have a duplicate made. Change the lock. Look, partial obedience is disobedience. Do not go out with him again. Oh, for the children's sake. For the children's sake, that's why you shouldn't go out with them. For you end up with another child. Do not go out with them. Oh, I feel strong, Rev. Feelings lie all the time. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Then, forgive yourself. Let you go. You're not holier than God. If he is willing to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, you must let you go. He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You must let you go and you must forgive you. And go on with your life. Stop living in the past, living in the thing. Going over it over and over. Whoa, I was stupid to do that, that, and that. Well, you were. Well, you're not now. Get up some sense and go on with your life. If you keep repeating the same thing and not making a stand and forgiving yourself, you will keep doing the same thing and you'll hold yourself in that rut. And you need to let you go. Everybody else has gone on with their life. They don't care about you. You are the only person who hasn't let go of you. And you need to let go of you. Yes. You need to accept God's love. You need to accept God's love for you. And understand that you are to die for. 1 Peter 4, 8, Jeremiah 31, 3 and 4. John 3, 16. A soul tie is an attachment. It's a mental attachment. 
You want them, the person, your will is involved. You want them. You know you want them with your, you say, Rev, you know the spirit is willing, but the flesh, brother, the flesh, the flesh is weak, you know. You know, I got a weakness for sweetness. Well, drink bitters. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Mm. A soul tie is an attachment. It's a mental attachment. You want that person. Your will is involved. You cry over them. You get angry and upset over them. Your emotions are connected to them. That's why you get angry when you think of them. That's why you cry when you think of them. That's why you get upset when you think of them. Me, I don't want him no more. And he comes along, you're gone because Willie got the sweet back. You must change your mind, Romans 12 and 2. You must renew your mind. Proverbs 16 and 3. You must commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Philippians 4 and 8, whatsoever things are pure, you must think on these things. Learn to refocus. Get a book and read, girl. Learn some new skill. Do something else. Refocus instead of focusing on him. You know at what time he used to come, and when that time is coming, you start to feel all energized and itchy and scratchy and lusty. Use that time. Go to take a swim. Refocus. Forgive the person who lied to you and told you they would marry you just to get you in bed, and once they got you in bed and pregnant... They went up and left and laughed at you and called you every fool in the book. Forgive them anyhow, because as long as you don't forgive them, you will stay connected to them. Hate is a connector. And a soul tie is already strong by itself. You don't need to attach hate to that to connect you twice. You're already connected because of sleeping with them. Stay away from that person, those people. Break all connections. Give no place to the devil. Stay away. Don't check up on them. Don't check up on their Facebook page. Don't check up and see what they're doing. Don't look at the old picture with you and them. Get rid of that picture. Pray for a reattached soul. Pray for a reconnected soul. Ask God to bring back all the pieces of your soul that are everywhere. Bring it back to you. Listen to me good. You can live without people. But you can't live without God. Make your connection with God and stick to it. And then, don't believe their lie that you're ugly. Don't believe their lie that you're fat. Don't believe their lie that nobody will want you. Don't believe their lie that you'll never make it without them. Well, you're ugly. Well, if I'm ugly, why you want me? You claim that I'm ugly, but you're all over me, like white on rice. If I were that ugly, how come you didn't see all the other people that were beautiful? You saw me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, you're too fat. Weren't you the one that says more woman to hold, more man to hold? Huh? Didn't you say that? Didn't you say that? Sometimes you have to give the devil a war. No one will want you. Obviously, that's a lie because you wanted me. Aren't you someone? What are you, invisible? Non-existent? You wanted me, and if you could want me, somebody else would. I'm the cat's meow and the dog's bow. Whoa. I am wantable. You'll never make it without me. I was making it before I met you. I started to do less after I met you. And as long as you're gone, the anchor will be gone and a sister can float like a cream to the top and get on with her life. You're an anchor for me, mister. You've done nothing for me but bring embarrassment on this big head child that has a head like you. I'll have a constant reminder. You'll never make it without me. When people say that, it's because they're terrified that your life will be humongously successful and there's nothing that they added or did to make you a success. They know a success when they saw one. That's why they came to you. They want to ride on your coattail and get successful themselves. Understand that the fear of man brings a snare. Don't be afraid of people's words. Don't let their insult get to you. Replace their insults with the word of God. Proverbs 29, 25, and 26. Uh, finally. Don't call them. Don't call on their phone. Don't call them. Don't call them when you're dumb. And what is it with some people, you're on Facebook talking about, I feel lonely. Stop that nonsense. You're sending out signals to all kinds of perverts out there. And some of them are your friends. And others of them are your relatives, for God's sake. In this world, in this time, absolutely uh-uh. Don't you be saying, uh, I feel so tired. I feel so broken up. I feel so lonely. I feel so depressed. Don't give out those signals in the public Facebook. Stop doing that. You can't tell people to stop doing that, Rev. S-T-O-P-D-O-I-N-G. T-H-A-T. I didn't say it. I spelt it. 
Don't call on people that are, make you weak when you're down. Don't call on people when you're sad. Don't call them over when you're lonely. Because they will come with praise to deceive and flattery to get you in bed. Their sweet, smooth talk is an intoxicant. And they are using that call that you made to them to get their hooks into you, to get you back on the sheets again. The reason you can't move on is because there's a demonic connection with this one, that man. Soul ties have demonic consequences and demonic connections. Soul ties are spiritual. A soul tie wants to limit you, to enslave you. A soul tie opens satanic doors. A soul tie is an open door to the spirit realm that opens up to the satanic world and open up satanic doors and satanic highways and you can't handle what's coming at you. House warehouse. House warehouse. House warehouse. A warehouse can be possibly 50 to 500 a million square footage of property. A warehouse. A house, 3,000 square feet is considered a good size house. 3,000 square feet is considered a good size house. Got six bedrooms in a, in a 3,000 square foot house. But a warehouse can be a million square feet. A house can fit into a warehouse 50, 60, 100 times and have space. When you as a child of God who have been living clean and pure for all this time connect with a person who has been living for Satan for all of their life, they are a warehouse of spirits. A person who is not living for God is a warehouse of satanic spirits. Huh? A person who is living for God is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a house of the Holy Spirit. But just a house, but over here is a warehouse. You slip, you fall, you connect yourself to a warehouse. What that warehouse person now is doing is downloading all of what is stored in them into you. A house cannot take off all that a warehouse is downloading. That is why you get schizophrenic. That is why you have these sessions of unstoppable lust. You go searching. One woman told me, said, Rev, I have to go out every night and sleep with a man. Every night I have to find a man because I get, I get itching and scratching. I don't know. Since I slept with so-and-so, I just, I just break out, Rev. What can I do? And tell him what to do. No, no that's too hard. A house cannot hold what a warehouse can hold. When you see that person coming at you smiling, you have to say to yourself, this is a trap. My house cannot hold what's in that warehouse coming at me. You don't have to believe me. Some people have to have the experience. And they have to, they have to go through the bitter thing. Then they come later on and say, you know that thing you warned me about? It's true, you know, they had to experience it. They couldn't take your word for it. They couldn't take the scripture for it. They couldn't take God's for it. They couldn't take their pastor's admonishment. They couldn't listen to their mother. They couldn't listen to their sister. They had to experience it for themselves. And that soul tie has impinged upon them, has fractured and cracked and snatched away a piece of them, torn apart. There's somebody walking around in this world with a piece of you because of soul ties. May God deliver you from evil. Let's pray this simple prayer. Say, O oh Lord, I come to you and I ask you to restore my soul. <sighs> restore my soul. He leadeth me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He restoreth my soul. Eh? Doesn't the scripture say that? So restoration of your soul that was lost, the peace that was lost to somebody... It's a biblical possibility. He restoreth my soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. You know the prayer. He restores your soul. He stores back your soul. He gets it from wherever it is and brings it back to you and puts it back into you so you're whole again. You have your soul again. You have your whole soul. And when you have your whole soul, now you can love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. Because your soul is not fragmented, your soul is not lost, your soul is not with some warehouse somewhere. I break the power of soul ties over your life. 
and I infuse you with battle aggression that you are able to stand having done all. No good thing will he withhold from you because you want to walk uprightly. May the Lord break the evil soul ties that bind you and restore your soul to its normal place again. To the glory of God I have prayed. <sighs> In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ his Son. Amen and amen.